Kelly Kesser Jane show. Let's talk. And I am Kelly Kesser Jane. Welcome to my listeners in the United States and around the world. Tune in to the Kelly Kesser Jane show at hellykesserjane.com. Jimmy Buffett, Margaritaville. Yep, today on the Kelly Kesser Jane show, we are taking a trip to Margaritaville in search of that lost shaker of salt with author Ryan White, out with a new compelling and rollicking portrait of the legendary pirate captain of Margaritaville. As told in the acclaimed music critic's candid new biography, Jimmy Buffett, A Good Life All the Way. And we're suggesting a great new book to read while you sip on your margarita and bask in the golden sunshine. Author Lisa C.'s new novel, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, my guest in the second half hour. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Let's get to it. Who wouldn't want to read a book that begins like this? Captain Tony's Saloon at 428 Green Street, Key West, Florida, was once an ice house and then a morgue. Actually, it was an ice house and a morgue simultaneously because that's a smart use of resources on a little island. And thus begins Ryan White's compelling and rollicking portrait of the legendary pirate captain of Margaritaville, as told in the acclaimed music critic's candid new biography, Jimmy Buffett, A Good Life All the Way. Jimmy Buffett, the iconic pop of trop rock, the pirate captain of Margaritaville, the one person with whom we would all like to share a cheeseburger in paradise. Writer, performer, Buffett has earned millions through record sales and top-grossing concert tours, but he is also the CEO behind, and get this, a $1.5 billion per year Margaritaville industrial complex, a vast network of merchandise, chain restaurants, resorts, lifestyle products, and now about to open Margaritaville retirement homes. But before he became the flip-flop music legend and the CEO of Margaritaville, Inc., there was the kid from Pascaluga, Mississippi. There have been a lot of changes in attitudes, changes in latitudes in James William Buffett's life, and Ryan White, the author of Springsteen, album by album, who has twice been named one of the top feature writers in the country by the Society for Features Journalism, explores them all. Let's talk. All right, so Ryan, you have been living in Margaritaville for quite some time researching this terrific new book of yours. What's it like to live in Margaritaville? Did you find your lost shaker of salt? And what did you find out about him? I mean, talk to me. <laughs> you meet a lot of really interesting people uh, running Margaritaville, uh, running around Margaritaville. You meet a lot of uh, great musicians. You meet a lot of interesting business people. You meet a lot of people who, in you know, the 1970s, found their way to the end of the end of the road for for any number of reasons. Uh, and every now and then you do find a little piece of of what was i you know one of the one of the great boondoggles that i pulled off uh working on this book was i went down to key west for a week for the annual meeting of the minds which is the the big parrot head convention that they have every year and i looked at the hotel costs and i was like boy it's going to break me if i do this and then i looked at airbnb and discovered that i could live on a sailboat for a week in the florida keys for cheaper than I could stay in a hotel room. And I was like, well, of course you stay on a sailboat. You live on a sailboat for a week. And I was living on this boat, and there was a great little bar at the marina where they sold buck 75 beers out of a plastic cooler, and the bar had been seemed to have been completely assembled from leftover dock parts and stuff when they built the marina. And, you know, I was sitting in there one night, and one of those Florida rain showers comes up, and it's just pouring rain and uh, on the roof, and I start talking to the guy next to me, and he tells me that he had once been Minnesota's most wanted fugitive. And I don't know if this is true or not. Uh, I, I, I tried to find him later, and I couldn't find any record of it. But at the time, I said, let me buy you a beer. And I, t- I told my wife that story later. She goes, why did you buy him a beer? I said, well, if he was telling the truth, he was probably going to be way better at fighting than I was. And I wanted him to like me. And, and, and that felt a little bit like the old stories that I heard from Key West, the people that were down there in the early 70s when, when Jimmy arrived, where – you know, Tom Corcoran, who's the guy who gave Jimmy his first beer when Jimmy and Jerry Jeff Walker roared into the chart room bar in 1971. And, and uh, you know, Tom, Tom likes to refer to, to part of what was going on down there at the time as being, uh, being run by the gentlemen of the ocean. And after, you know, three or four times we're sitting there talking and Tom's saying, you know, the, he was also a gentleman of the ocean. 
I said, we mean smuggler, right? He goes, yeah, a gentleman of the ocean. <laughs> and, 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 and so it was in, you know, the beginnings of, of, of what was and understanding, you know, where the book ends and, and what Margaritaville has become. It was in that, that journey from, from there to here that I was, I was really interested in exploring how that happened because it all came about at a time when I personally was undergoing a lot of change. And, uh, uh, you know, I had had a job for 16 years at a newspaper, and I loved that job. And then that job disappeared because that's what newspaper jobs do. And uh, I, I needed to figure out how to how to navigate this next section of things. And and none of that is is in the book. Everybody else's stories were way way more interesting than mine. But you know, in along the way, it it, it helped me figure out some things. And I think. Ultimately, the reason why, you know, Jimmy Buffett has been a big star for 40 years is because he, he helps people figure a few things out or, you know, when the time is right, just set those things aside for a little bit and, and catch their breath. I love that. And I think that is really true. There are other bios and he's written uh, his own. Yeah. Why, why'd you do this now? Well, I mean, it, it, the, the only other real bio uh, that had been that had been written was, you know, almost 20 years ago. And so much has changed in 20 years in terms of the, the cultural impact of Margaritaville and, and the brand of, of Margaritaville. And, I, you know, and it, it was that here to there that, that really interested me. And I didn't feel like it had been explored. And I also felt like it, you know, it should probably be explored from somewhat outside the, uh, you know, outside the, the empire and, and with, you know, a, you know, an outside view. And I, I come from a, a very typically middle class uh, upbringing in a college town in the Midwest. And so, you know, I was, you know, kind of my people are, are the people who who really enjoy Jimmy Buffett. And, you know, I've watched my dad be less stressed uh, on uh, trips to Florida when I was a kid than, than, you know, he maybe sometimes was was elsewhere on these long walks staring yeah. out at the ocean. So, you know, I, I felt like it was I felt time. Like it was, yeah, it was it was time. I felt like it was time that somebody do it, uh, I guess, somewhat egotistically. I maybe thought that I was the one that could. It, it's a weird thing to say. And it's, you know, it's a big responsibility when you start diving into somebody else's story like this. But, you know, I had 16 years as a newspaper reporter and I knew how to report and I knew how to do this. And so, you know, I really, you know, it, in a weird way, I didn't set out to write a biography. I set out to, to write about Margaritaville, and Jimmy Buffett would be obviously in it. But what you find out really quickly is that you can't separate those two in any way. Like What brings people to Margaritaville is the spirit that Jimmy Buffett has carried through the world and through his career. And in fact, this was both a, a very good point and a, uh, and a nice bit of, uh, of, of trash talk towards a competitor. But I was talking with John Colin, who's the CEO of Margaritaville, and he, you know, in the middle of an answer says, and you know, there isn't really a Tommy Bahama. And he's right, there isn't. There really is a Jimmy Buffett. And so, you know, even if his picture isn't all over the hotel, the spirit and the, the lyrics and, you know, this, this world that he's created has, has built this thing. And so you had to explore his beginnings, his middle, and, you know, not his end, but where he's at now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip the beginning because, because there's an aspect of this that I got onto in reading the book that really surprised me. And, and because I think you've done something just a little bit different here, I want to go down that little bit different yeah. road. How's that? You like that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We so, like different. I, I, okay, so let's go with different. So let's go with this. Let's start here. How, how real is Jimmy Buffett or how contrived? And I mean that, I'm going to ask you that question twice as we go along here, but just, just now, you know, not defensively, but how much of him is real? How much of his, him is contrived? You know, everybody who steps on stage, uh, everybody who, who does anything, uh, you know, you, me and everybody else, we have a public face and we have a private face and, and, and his are different. His are not as is as, as separate as some people would would think and maybe more so uh, than others, which sounds like a really wishy washy kind of answer there. But, you know, I think there are people who think that he is just a burnout who does nothing but get drunk and get high and occasionally rolls himself on stage and plays Margaritaville. <laughs> and that couldn't be further from the truth. And then there are also people who think that he's just kind of become this soulless, uh, this soulless corporate hack. And that also isn't true. You know, he, he saw an opportunity once, you know, he kind of had to make his peace with the fact that he had this one hit. And that's a hard thing for, for some people 
to do that you know you you write other songs and you perform other songs and you you love other songs that you've written and yet the everybody's like okay but play margaritaville play volcano play cheese cheeseburger in paradise they call them the big eight and so he had to make his peace a little bit with the fact that this is what i have and this is what people like and you know i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna give it to him and you know as a person he really moves through the world with with a sense of wonder and enjoyment uh, that's awfully true to who he to who he is on stage. Now, the difference is like you know one of the reasons Margaritaville becomes a hit in 1977. Everybody's starting to come to Key West, and he left. He moved to Aspen uh, because he didn't like the aspect of people showing up on his porch and wanting to be the guy who got drunk with Jimmy Buffett. That that wasn't anything that he was into at all. And they actually had a you know they had a an intercom system put on the door at one point so that he could try and figure out who was ringing his doorbell. Uh, and his downstairs neighbor, Chris Robinson, got a bunch of free beer out of that uh, hmm. whole exchange. He would come out and drink it with him. But he, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think one of the real genuine things about him, and, and one of the first things I did when I started working on this, I went out and I bought all the vinyl that I could get my hands on because vinyl still just, uh, there's just better liner oh, notes, yeah. especially on the old yeah. records and stuff. There's so much information that you can pull from it. And you can lay out those records, you know, starting in 1973 up until, you know, 2013 when he put out his last record, Songs from St. Somewhere, you could almost put them into a flip book. And if you ran through it, it would animate and like he would lose his 70s mustache and his hair would thin and disappear, go white on the ends where it's left. And the one thing that never changes is, uh, is, is his smile. And that is, uh, that is him from all accounts. Uh, what everybody tells me, Mac McAnally, who stands next to him on stage every night, refers to what they do as a rolling ball of goodwill. And that starts with Jimmy. And that doesn't mean that there aren't times that he doesn't get, you know, get torqued off and he hasn't fired people and, you know, he doesn't get angry. There, there is a benevolent dictator uh, role that comes with leading a band and, and leading a company. But, you know, he's he's pretty true to that guy. OK, so let me go here with you. What's interesting to me about him on uh, on <laughs> what isn't interesting about him? He's a very interesting man. Not not no. all musicians are. I mean, I talk to them all day long, la, la, la. But this guy is, he, you know, he had a dream early on. He goes to Nashville. He doesn't cut it in Nashville. Could, sort of failed. It may be one of his yeah. few failures in his life. He got married. That that failed. But after that, it's pretty smooth sailing in terms of, of, of success. But he also seems to me, let's go back to Key West for this reason, only because I wonder, was it magic? Was it, seren was it serendipity? Was it hallucination? <laughs> you, know, you know, smoking out of that bong, whatever. A happenstance, friendship. What happened there? Because whatever happened there has been a magic carpet ride for this guy ever since. Talk to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was the right place at the right time. And, you know, some people are lucky enough to land there. And it's funny because Chris Robinson, who I mentioned a minute ago, I had a really long lunch with him on the beach in Key West. And we, we were talking about the way that the islands changed. And he's a fishing guide now up on uh, Sugarloaf Key, about 20, 25 miles uh, back up the road from Key West. And, and, you know, he was very pragmatic about the change and talked about how he still likes coming down to Key West. And then he noted that, you know, when he got there in 1972, the old timers pulled him aside and said, uh, you're 10 years too late. You should have been here then. But that island that Jimmy that Jimmy found, you know, one of the things that was going for it, it was empty. There there were there were not that many people down there now. And the, then and the people that were there, they were writers. They were they were artists. They were, you know, outcasts. And so it was this perfect little playground to to incubate weird ideas and, and really incubate mythology. Uh, the, the liner notes that Tom McGuane wrote for Buffett's first first album that he recorded after he'd gone to Key West, uh, 73's White Sport Coat and a Pink Crustacean. I mean, it's straight mythology making right up to the uh, the reference to the shadowy club mandible, which somebody told me really came about because uh, McGuane was going to make it into the, the who's who of America. And it had a question on the questionnaire. It said, what clubs are you part of? So they invented club mandible and everybody bought purple shirts. <laughs> and this group of them, Jimmy included, would hit the bars as hard as you could hit the bars in their purple shirts. But, you know, there was room to operate. There was room to grow. And when you wanted to be loud, you could be loud. And when you wanted peace and quiet to think, that existed too. So it, it was kind of one of those times where it, it was just the perfect creative, creative place. 
And it was at the end of the road. It was closer to Cuba than it was to Miami. And so when you spread that out into the culture, if you're, you know, if you're playing, you know, a student union in Hammond, Indiana on a Monday in March is as Buffett did. You know, I found the ad for that. That sounds really exotic and that sounds really cool. And that sounds like, you know, that sounds like something that you want to, to be in a place that you want to go. And, and he was he's a fantastic, fantastic storyteller. So he was able to spin that uh, into legend and myth. And all of that is is what carries it today. But you can't not talk about him and not say the man and his music. And we all have a set of rhythms, you know, or at least those of us who are musically inclined have a set of rhythms beating in our hearts and minds. And he grabbed on to his beat. Now, I know it took him a little time to get there you know, in terms of developing who he became. But, you know, there he was, you know, a bunch of guys hanging around or whatever. Not everybody would have been able to uh, um, mold this the way that he molded it musically. We'll talk about what he did. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Talk um, it, no, it's, you know, it's one of those things where if, you know, that, another thing that often gets ascribed to Jimmy Buffett is that this is easy. And if mm-hmm. it was easy, a whole lot more people would have done uh, what he's done because it looks like a lot of fun. And I think anybody who, who, who could do it would do it in a second. You know, he, he had a really interesting collection of influences, you know, some very literary influences, courtesy of his mom, who, who was a big reader. And then growing up on the Gulf Coast, they'd get the radio from New Orleans. And New Orleans was different. I, you know, I was, I was really, really, really lucky. If, if nothing else comes out of this book, I got to sit down and talk with Alan Toussaint before, uh, before he died. Yeah, cool. And, uh, and, you know, I, I've, you know, in 20 years of journalism, I have done probably thousands of interviews. I have asked for a photo at the end of exactly one interview, and that was with, uh, was with Alan Toussaint, and I will treasure that, that forever. But he, he talked about, you know, New Orleans music as being out of the way in that musical trends in America generally go left to right or right to left. They start in New York, work their way to Los Angeles, start in Los Angeles, work their way to, to New York. There are occasional exceptions to the rule that there always are but he as he noted he said you got to kind of take your let take a let you got to work to take a left or a right to get down to the boot as he said to down to new orleans and and so they're kind of left alone a little bit like key west to create and do their own things and be behind the times or ahead of the times or whatever time that they want and so kind of the joy and the the rhythms and the 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 fun and the 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 just the, the brassiness of what they were were doing in New Orleans kind of sat there in in uh, in Jimmy's head and and combined with you know the carnival culture of of Mobile where they they have an older Mardi Gras than New Orleans and you can go uh, you can go to Mobile now and there's a great carnival uh, museum and stand on a float uh, a sample float in the middle of this room and it shakes and rattles as if it's going down the street uh, and you're on it and you look out over this this big photo of a of a carnival crowd and you realize that it probably doesn't look all that different from what uh, Jimmy Buffett sees every night when he goes on stage. Everybody dressed up and bejeweled and bedazzled and uh, and ready to have some fun. And so, you know, those things helped really direct him. And yeah, he, I mean, he, he scuffed around. He was in Nashville. He was too folk to be country and he was too country to be rock and roll and didn't really fit in. And even those first, you know, those first few albums before Margaritaville, which uh, people really revere and are, are really, really great records, the instrumentation is very country on them. And it was Norbert Putnam, who was from Muscle Shoals, Alabama, one of the first musicians to come out of there and go to Nashville, who produced that record, who suggested to Jimmy, you know, hey, let's let's get out of Nashville and let's go to Miami and record. Let's get you by the water and let's add some uh, some Caribbean inspiration to it. And that was when everything broke open for him. It really is interesting how there's one key that will unlock a door for a, for a musician for them to get down to that style. I, I'm always yeah. fascinated by that. Answer me this question about Buffett. The heart yeah. of a poet, the soul of a what? Uh, of a wanderer, I think. Uh, maybe maybe a vagabond. Uh, I think he'd say pirate. Uh, but but I think it's uh, I, I think it's it's more than that. I mean, he really is to this day. He is constantly moving somewhere on this planet. He does it now, you know, he, he has a whole history and there's a, there's a, a run early in the book of wrecked rental cars and an ex-wife's wrecked car. And he was just, he was, he was terrible on cars and constantly losing people's keys and, and stuff like that. But there was always another rental car there to move him to another place, to get on a plane, to get on a train. He does the same thing now. It's just his plane. Um, and, <laughs> which, which is a nice way to do it. He just, you know, he was just, uh, 
they did uh, they did the Byron Bay Blues Fest in Australia, uh, and then two shows in New Zealand. And before that, he was surfing in Fiji, and after that, he was bone fishing on Christmas Island. Uh, ran into Harrison Ford in Fiji, as you do. You know, ran into surfer Kelly Slater in Australia, as you do. And he he's just always somewhere. Uh, he's you know, a magnet he, he, too. He is such a magnet. Things come to him that don't come to other people and I think that you see that all through his life. It's fascinating. You you spoke with a lot of people, obviously. Yep. Um, yep. This is this is the thing. People came out to talk to you from under the bar so to speak because they were really honest <laughs> with you. It's true. They must have, y'all were drinking together. I don't know. I, but I'm curious about out of all of those people not only who you spoke with but who have been in his ex- who do you think was the most influential person Person alive who to him who do you think is the one person that's so powerful to his existence wow i mean i mean he is in some ways the the son of the whole thing like you know it's his gravity that keeps so much of it up in the air and 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 moving you know i i you know i i, I would really have to say probably alan Toussaint. i mean I, you get the sense and, and you you can find videos of them playing together and stuff and the only time i've ever seen jimmy look awkward on stage is alan wrote a song called hang with jimmy buffett and and, and i asked him about it and he said you know he, i was just watching the news one day and everything was bad and i thought man i just want to hang with jimmy buffett <laughs> and, and he wrote this song and there, there's one video of it and they're playing it and jimmy's singing on it but you can tell that he just doesn't quite know what to do with himself like he can't even believe that he's on a stage with alan toussaint much less alan toussaint wrote a song about him and and you know the 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 way that uh, that the style that that alan had and you know when he when he died there were these wonderful reminiscences of uh um, the, these stories at his at his memorial about his his impeccable suits, and yet he would always be wearing sandals. Uh, and you know, Jimmy, Captain Casual. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to tell you know his work uniform from his his other uniform because it's just a slightly nicer T-shirt on stage, I guess. But um, but you know, he he has a he has a flair for like his his touring guitars. They're like like it's a 1946 Martin. And like one of the original electric guitars that are they, these are not guitars that people tour with. These are guitars that that successful musicians get their hands on and keep locked away at home because you don't ever want to risk anything happening to them. But they're really cool guitars. I mean, there was a photo of uh, of Toussaint's. Uh, he had a he had a Rolls uh, he had a Rolls Royce parked next to a stage at Jazz Fest a year or two ago with his license plate, which just said "Songs." <laughs> Love that. Uh, yeah. Which. You know, is, is is a fantastic amount of style, and I think you know both stylistically and, and, and spiritually. I think the person that I would have to answer that with would be would be Alan. Okay, this astonishes me. Albums touring. He's actually making more money touring than on albums these days. That's fine. That's true. Oh yeah, that's that's actually true of most people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a crazy business right now. But what a power that Jimmy Buffett brand is. I mean, first of all, I did not know any of this. One point five billion per year Margaritaville industrial complex, this vast network of merchandise, chain restaurants, resorts, lifestyle. Now he's, I, I live in Florida, now he's coming down here and he's going to be building all of these uh, retirement, Margaritaville yeah. <laughs> retirement homes. Can't wait to see the first one of those. <laughs> Here's my question. What the hell yeah. is driving this man? He doesn't have to do this. 1.5 billion and he's going yeah. strong. What's the, what? And what is what is the fire in his butt? Opportunity, uh, to a degree. Uh, the challenge of it, to a degree. And and to be fair, he doesn't have to do. He's not out there working out the licensing deals and and nailing down, you know, uh, the the layout for the retirement community. He he's been very smart. This is this is one of the things that I think he doesn't get enough credit for is understanding, you know, understanding himself and his appeal, but also understanding how to run things. He's always been very good at finding very qualified, very competent people who are good at their job and letting them do it. He comes in and and has his thoughts on things. But John Colin, who's the CEO of Margaritaville, is really, really smart. Uh, Jimmy's tour managers really know what they're doing. And and people work for Jimmy 
for a long, long, long time. He maintains relationships for a long, long time. I mean, he still sees Milton Brown, who was the guy who helped him record his first two songs ever in Mobile, Alabama, and helped shop him around Nashville. He stops by to see Milton. Uh, you know, Joe Nuzo, who runs a surf shop in, in Tampa, uh, you know, Joe wasn't there the last time, you know, Jimmy stopped in. But every now and then, Jimmy will just materialize at the surf shop because his old friend is there. And, uh, and, and so he maintains these relationships. He understands what the appeal is, what they're selling. And he lets people do their jobs. And, and, you know, it has just kind of taken on a life of its own really in the last five or six years with, you know, there's, you mentioned the retirement community. There's a $800 million resort uh, that's going in right on the west, uh, kind of right off the west end of, of Disney World. Uh, the first words in this book actually are Jimmy's, uh, from Jimmy's testimony before the State Gaming Control Board in Nevada, which he had to do to get his casino operator's license because he's got a piece of the flamingo. But now, you don't. You don't. But you don't call him driven. You just think he's the, the opportunity is there, so he's playing it. Is that is that that's your assessment? Oh, I, I mean, I he's he's definitely he's been driven. Uh, he he might still very well be driven. Um, I I think once you get to I think once you get to seventy years old uh, and you have all the money and the resources that you have. Uh, you know, I, I think you, you allow yourself to relax a little and it would be, it would be impossible for somebody to do everything that he's doing and keep very tight control on the business. I think, you know, I think that's where you, you have to learn where to take your foot off the gas and, he's and a let good other business people man. do their job. Well, the point is he's a bit, he's a good businessman because he knows right. how to run the business. Question. Yes. What's more important to him, fame or fortune? Uh, I don't think it's fame, you know, going all the way back to, uh, going all the way back to that first record, white sport coat and a pink crustacean. There's that line about, I don't want the fame that brings confusion where people recognize you on a plane. I think if he had his way, he'd get his adulation on stage and then never be recognized off it and be able to move through the world. That doesn't quite happen. Although he, you know, he, he's able to move around someplace like jazz fest in new Orleans with a, with a ball cap and a hat on and, and people don't seem to, uh, don't seem to recognize him. I think the fortune is, is very, very nice, but I, I think the fortune buys him the freedom to to do the things that he wants to do, and that's probably the that's probably the third F word uh, that is uh, th- that is really the most important thing to him is is the ability to to still travel to 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 still get out and live. To, he wants to, to see live. the world and to yeah. live. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he likes to live. Uh, th- th- that's clear. You know, I have to tell you something funny about him because I've seen him on Long Island. He's a very different person off off. Look wise, I mean, he, he looks like he's from Cigar Magazine when you see him, uh, you know, out, <laughs> out in the Hamptons. I mean, a gorgeously, uh, you know, white jacket, you know, and uh, he could be wearing Gucci shoes for all I know. And his wife, look, and I'm like, he, he doesn't look a thing like Margaritaville. It's like to me, it's like there are two Jimmys, you know. There's the the elite Jimmy, and then there's the one he puts out there, and 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 not many people get to see him in his everyday, you know. I, and right. I find it funny that, by the way, that they live where they live on Long Island, and 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 not down here all the time. And, and, yeah, I mean, I know? mean, they live they live all over now. I mean, right. Half the half the winters in St. Bart's, right? And, right. You know, but, I, but, I think he's maybe has another place out in Aspen because he's been there a bunch lately, and it's hard to keep track of the properties. He bought a about a nine million dollar place in the the Hollywood Hills a couple of years ago, and and yeah, I mean, he is very comfortable running running with with that highbrow crowd and and he kind of always has been you know when when margaritaville hit and key west really shrunk for him and we you know they got to where everybody was knocking on the door wanting to get drunk with jimmy buffett he moved to aspen he and he and jane because they were then you know they were just two more sort of even compared to aspen at the time famous faces because you know uh, Jack Nicholson was showing up there. Everybody was starting to go to Aspen at that time. The Eagles were there, and the Eagles were far bigger rock stars than than he was. And uh, but he loved hanging out with them, and he loved being part of that circle. And he fit in. He fit in perfectly. And uh, so yeah, I mean, he can navigate a lot of different worlds. Yeah, which it's interesting. Is, yeah, I, I find that fascinating. I'm, I'm rushing you through because I have a couple more questions, yeah, and I'm watching yeah, my my go. clock. And one of the <laughs> one I like, like a guy who can keep up with me because I'm I'm running all around. I, Here's the deal with him also, or with you. I'm curious, after everything that you did here, what was the one thing that you discovered that most surprised you? The one thing that most surprised me was, I, I, I keep coming back to just how he was able to, to step outside of the chaos of, of the initial success when it really hit. And I think it's one of the benefits uh, of, of that success hitting when you're 30 years old as opposed to 23 or 24. 
Um, but you know, everybody who was in the band uh, in the you know in the late seventies, early eighties, they they talk about how how well he was able to to navigate because they weren't able to guide themselves through anything. They were uh, they were really partying and and they were you know it was they could they would get it together to to do absolutely everything that they had to do on stage uh, for an hour and a half, two hours a night. But the rest of the time, in part because they didn't have a lot to do, there were people there now to carry their bags. And Key Sykes tells the really funny story in the book about how the running joke was, uh, you know, you, you you step off stage, you step into a limo, it takes you to a plane, the plane takes you to another city, you step off the, the plane, and it's like, wait, we've got to walk to the next limo? What do you mean we have right. to walk to yeah. the next limo? But there's um, another side to that, which is fame is the loneliest place in the world to live. Yeah. And yeah. most people don't get that. Most people are, are wanting that fame and wanting that fame. And then when they get there, how many of them implode? Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't let that box him in. No, which I, you got to give the guy credit for. You have to know that he has, you know, he's got a his head sitting firm on the shoulders of his. And God bless him for that, because there aren't a whole lot of them who get as big as he did, you know, who, who, uh, who, who carry it as well. The word exactly. legend as well as he does. Ryan, you write in your book, great, great line, four decades on, there's still nobody who understand, to, who understand who Jimmy Buffett is and what Jimmy Buffett does better than Jimmy Buffett. Isn't that the key? Yeah. You know, he, he was always true to who he was when he, and, and, and just felt like the world was going to have to come around to him or it wouldn't. And, and the, you know, one of the funniest things to me in the book, and it's funny to them too, Mac McAnally and Mike Utley and I talked a lot about this, was, you know, for years, from the very beginning, before he went to Key West, Nashville was this this riddle that he couldn't crack. And so eventually he quit trying and just, you know, went back to just being Jimmy Buffett. And they look up one day and suddenly Kenny Chesney is singing Jimmy Buffett songs. And Alan Jackson is calling and saying, hey, you want to sing on this song that asks the question, what would Jimmy Buffett do? <laughs> and, you know, Zach Brown Band's calling and saying, hey, we got this uh, we got this song about the beach. You want to come sing on it? And like Nashville suddenly sounded like Jimmy Buffett uh, in the late 90s and uh, and into the early part of uh, of this century. And so he just, you know, he understood he saw things that other people couldn't see. In, in Nashville when he was down there originally and even after he went to Key West, they couldn't imagine anybody being big if you didn't get on the radio. And yeah, he got on the radio for, uh, you know, for Margaritaville, but that was pretty much it. There were a few other minor hits, top 40, but not not any higher than than 30. But he knew who he was and that he had a story to tell. And, and he knew how to tell it, which is the most important thing. And on that note, Ryan, it's time to go get drunk and screw. And thanks for a quick <laughs> trip around jimmy buffett's son love this book thanks darling thank you so much all right i've been speaking with ryan white the author of the new jimmy buffett bio jimmy buffett a good life all the way for more information on ryan white and his book visit ryan.white.com you are listening to the heli caster jane show my guests today are ryan white author of the new biography jimmy buffett a good life all the way and New York Times bestselling author Lisa C., whose new book is The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. Tune in to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show at HallieKesserJane.com. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. A message from the American Podcast Council. Every month, one out of five Americans listens to a podcast, and that's fantastic. But friend, we can do better. All this month, we want you to find one of those four Americans who doesn't listen to podcasts. A friend, a relative, the only cool co-worker in your office. Find that person and explain to them, slowly but gently, what a podcast is, where to find one, and then how to listen to it. When you complete that mission, tell us what you recommended with the hashtag tripod. That's T-R-Y pod. How do I love the writing of Lisa C.? Let me count the ways. The four-time New York Times bestselling author, whose titles include On Gold Mountain, Snowflower, and The Secret Fan, Shanghai Girls, and Dreams of Joy, never disappoints. Her latest novel, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, is testament to a powerful story about two women separated by circumstance, culture, and distance. Set in China's Yunnan Mountains, Lian and her family, members of the Aka ethnic minority, live according to the precise rituals of their people. 
Then one day, the market economy, in the form of a businessman seeking a rare tea, arrives at their remote village and changes the community forever. As Leanne's family adapts to the incursion of the outside world, she falls in love with a boy who her mother believes is an inauspicious match. When she bears his child, she leaves her baby wrapped in a blanket with a special tea cake inside on the steps of a nearby orphanage instead of hewing to the tradition that would have her killed the little girl. Through hard work, education, and appreciation for pure, her people's special tea, Leanne eventually makes a life for herself in the wide world outside her village. Yet even as she finds a business and a husband that she loves, she never stops thinking about her lost daughter. A story of family, identity, and motherhood. Lisa sees the tea girl of Hummingbird Lane is a moving journey through a little-known world and a ride through the magic and mysteries of ancient Chinese culture and the equally mysterious bond of mother and child. Let's talk. So Lisa, always wonderful to have you here. But before we talk about the book, I want to talk about you. (laughs) Just Lisa. Lisa. You're bicultural, what, one-eighth Chinese? Yes. Clearly, you're fascinated with Chinese culture. Talk first about your heritage. Your, tell us about your great-grandfather. This is the, the story that you're, of, of your family. Unbelievable. Delicious. Right. So, actually, it was my great-great-grandfather who came here to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. My great-grandfather came and stayed. And he was a pretty interesting man. He was the first Chinese in America to own an automobile. He used to sell tickets to see his stuffed mermaid. He had four wives, one of whom was Caucasian. This was back when it was against the law for Chinese and Caucasians to marry in California. It was against the law in 28 states. In some states, they didn't overturn that law until 1967, but here in California, it was 1952. And today in Los Angeles, I I have about 400 relatives. There are about a dozen that look like me. Your listeners can't see me, but red hair and freckles. And the majority are still full Chinese and then this spectrum in between. And so even though an eighth doesn't sound very big, the fact is when I was a kid, especially, you know, when I looked around, what I saw were Chinese faces. What I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition. You know, in a way, it's the people who are around us who are our mirror. They're the ones who tell us who we are. And so that's, you know, that's why I write the kinds of books that I do. I, I feel like I'm trying to, it's not that I'm trying to explain who I am to other people. Rather, it's my, I feel like I'm trying to look deeper inside myself about what do I know? What do I not know? How do I, how do I fit in to Chinese culture? How do I fit into sort of larger American culture? And it's each book I feel like is another exploration of that for me, just on a personal level. And I find that utterly fascinating, utterly, utterly fascinating. The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, best title ever, begins with, is it Akha? How do you pronounce that? Akha. Yeah, uh, you have Akha. it exactly right. Okay. Aphorism, no coincidence, no story. But let me take you here before we talk about the book. You, you've had such an interesting career. You really have. You started off as a West Coast correspondent for Publishers Weekly, but your career trajectory changed in 1995 after you published your first book on Gold Mountain, The 100-Year Odyssey of My Chinese-American Family. That became, let me tell everybody, a national bestseller. That's when I was introduced to you. And a New York Times notable book. But you write your wonderful novels and you write for so many publications. Did your fortune cookie predict that all of this writing success was going to happen? It was going to come your way? Are there no coincidences or are there many? Uh, well, I think all of us who get to a certain age, we know that it is it coincidence, is it fate, is it destiny, is it luck? You know, that there's some combination of those that brings us to where we are in our lives, no matter at what point, you know, whether we're 20 or 60. So if someone had said to me, though, when I was 20, that I was going to be a writer or a best-selling writer, I never would have believed it. Because actually, I really didn't want to be a writer. My mother was a writer, and I thought I knew certain things about myself, um, that I didn't want to be a writer, I didn't want to get married, I didn't want to have kids. I always wanted to live out of a suitcase. That was my, my one thing that I knew. And when I was in college, I took two years. Well, I didn't know it was going to be two years, but I, I thought, I'm going to Europe, I'm never coming back. And, of course, the problem with that is you have to 
you don't earn a living. <laughs> so, I, you know, I knew those things about myself, and I kept thinking, well, how am I going to do that? How am I going to, you know, not do all these usual things? And there was one morning, I was living in Greece, and I woke up, and it was like a light bulb went off. I thought, oh, I could, I could be a writer. And when I came home about six months later, so it was, I was gone for a total of two years, which, you know, meant different than being gone forever. Within the first 48 hours, I had my first two magazine assignments. And my mother helped me get those. But I've been writing ever since. And so I started just doing, you know, freelance journalism. My mother and a friend of ours and I collaborated on three books together under the name of Monica Highland. And then I was working for Publishers Weekly when I started work on On Gold Mountain. And so my first book that was just with my own name on it, I was 40 years old when that was published. Mm, you come a long way, baby, let me tell you what. Tea, the tea girl of a hummingbird lane is proof to that, as I said to you off air. I think this is your best. And I think it's your best because I think it's your most honest. Honestly, this, this, this book tore me to shreds. But that being said, coincidence. Coincidences in this story of yours. And, you know, there are certain, what? There are certain things that we understand about the Chinese culture that are different than the Western culture. And even how the Chinese deal with coincidence and fate, things like that, is so inherent to them what the Western cu- culture might brush off. People mm-hmm. like you and I who've lived in other cultures or understand other cultures uh, might, might accept that. But maybe the average reader doesn't. So talk to coincidence as it is in the tea girl of Hummingbird Lane. I did want to just point out one thing, which is, you know, yes, it is Chinese culture, but this is very specific to the Aka ethnic minority. So that's an right. Aka saying, and they have you know, their own traditions, their own culture, their own language, uh, even though they live in China, but they, you know, they are their own culture within this larger Han people culture uh, that makes up the majority of, of China. So, yes, there are many coincidences that happen throughout the book, but even some of them as I was writing them, and somebody would pop up all of a sudden. I think of when Leon, the main character, there's a point where she goes off to Thailand, walks to Thailand, and, and on her way she's in this little village and runs into someone that I never expected to show up again in the book, Deja the woman who gave birth to the twins early in the in the novel. And then she show pops up again completely unexpectedly much later. And both of those came as a surprise to me as I was writing it. But at the same time, that character had to be there, it turned out. She just wasn't done telling her story somehow. So there are these series of coincidences that run throughout the novel. But also I have to say that For me personally, there was a series of coincidences that actually led me to this book. Um, The first was I was walking down the street, going to the movies with my husband, and I saw this older white couple walking with their adopted teenage Chinese daughter between them. And she had her hair up in a ponytail, and it was swinging back and forth. And I, I had this vision of her as being kind of like a fox spirit in that family. In Chinese tradition, fox spirits can be pretty naughty. They can be pretty mischievous. They're always doing things like sneaking into a scholar's study late at night. And there he is, you know, working hard, studying for the imperial exam. And so then she'll have sex with him, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They're naughty and they're mischievous. But in their best moments, they can bring great love and create families. And so when I saw that swinging ponytail, I just thought, yeah, she's like a fox spirit. She's brought great love and and through her presence has created a family. And although I had been thinking about writing about the one child policy, but also the other side of the one child policy was transnational adoption. I've probably been thinking about that for 20 years, maybe more. But this was the moment when I thought, now I know my way into the story. Now I can write that story. Now that I had this vision. But I didn't have a historic backdrop. And these last few books, all of them have been historic novels. I didn't worry about it too much. I just thought, well, I'll just start doing the research on one-child policy and adoption and just not worry. And a couple of months later, I gave a talk at a library. And it was a very large event. 
and they had brought in somebody to be kind of an opening act, and he did a Chinese tea pouring demonstration. I got to sit up on the stage with him and taste this tea, and he kept talking, you know, talked about tea in general, the second most popular drink in the world after water and things like that. But then he started talking about pu'er, this one particular tea that grows in the tea trees, the original tea trees that are still in Yunnan. Some of these trees, you know, 200, 800, 1,000 years old. And then he said this one thing, that just that year, so now three years ago, there was a single cake of that tea, a little under a pound, that had just sold at auction for the equivalent of 150,000 U.S. dollars. And when I heard that, I thought, oh, now I know what my historic backdrop is going to be. So what, you know, how, what was it that brought me to that man at that moment? I didn't know he was going to be there. I hadn't planned for it. And so there were just things like that that kept happening. Another was um, my husband was at a board meeting and one of the, you know, other fellow board member asked him, so, you know, what's Lisa working on these days? And my husband, here as he is, was, I don't know, it's something to do with tea. <laughs> and this man asked, well, is it Pu'er? The next day, I Chui is his name, he sent me an email, and it turned out that just the week before, he had been at a big Chinese banquet where he was seated next to a woman who's the largest importer of Pu'er into the United States, and did I want to meet her? Wow. So it was just things like that, one after another, that, that led me into the story all the way to the very end. And I... I don't, you know, and then at the same time, there's the this idea of no coincidence, no story that starts the novel and, of course, carries through. So I, I feel like, we, you know, the novel and I were on sort of a parallel course of, of um, no coincidence, no story. I always say that when that happens in life, that means that you're, you're, you're where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's pretty powerful to know that. So you knew you had to go ahead with it, and and and, it, and I and and I, that tells me it'll be a winner too, because it, you know the gods want you to go there with it. You did a lot of research for this book. Uh, I think maybe even more than you've ever done before, and it shows in the book. And what I found so fascinating here, I got to tell you, this is. You know, I got to go online and I read everything that's been written about you and about the book, and da 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 da. da. I was riveted by the historical brilliance that you brought into this book, this great research that was not dictated to me, but was part of the story. Well, well, that's the trick, right, to make that happen. And I'll tell you what, when I'm writing what, in the first draft, the first draft is probably 100 pages longer. And it's because I use all of the research, you know, I feel like, well, I found it, I've got to use it. And then as I'm editing, I start pulling it out and I, I don't know if you've ever played Jenga, mm -mm. you know, you make no. this, this, this tower and then you start pulling out the pieces and the whole idea is how many pieces can you pull out and the structure still remain. And so I, I feel like that's what the editing and, and the, for me, really creating the novel and to find that balance of um, story and, and sort of historic facts is to pull out as much as you can so that you know that it's there and it's holding up the structure and it's sound and yet it isn't overpowering. And that you have to feel as though you're not observing the culture, rather you're in the culture, like in the room. I often think of this example with Snowflower and the Secret Fan. I wrote about foot binding, and there's a scene where the little the two girls are having their feet bound. And one of the early readers, it was someone in my agent's office. She's a young woman, but she said, "You know, you have to come out. You have to tell people that foot binding is bad. You know, and and you have to come out personally and say that and make it be clear in the novel." And I said, "Well, that's not my job at all. I just want to be in the room with them." And if you can actually feel as though you're in the room with these characters, these people, whether they're fictional or real, that then you, you can experience what they're going through with them, with the, without an overlay of judgment. And then, you know, I think as a reader and as a person, you can come to your own conclusions, you know, about something like foot finding. You know, I don't, I don't have to say it's bad. I think anybody can read what it's about and 
experience it through the eyes of this little girl and know, oh man, this is this is bad. I wouldn't want that happening to me. Absolutely, and 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 preaching never is never a good uh, story to tell. That, no. that I think that's what you're basically saying. Right. This is about the Akam people, and and they're a pretty uh, what undiscovered kind of still backwards uh, hold a lot of the old tradition uh, in in their world. There are some brutal things going on in this book, kiddo. And yet, I want to, and I want to talk about one, one particular scene. Let me just set it up so that people understand what we're talking about, because there are themes that run through the story. Obviously, one of them is mother-daughters, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and that relationship. And the other is the old world, and, and how this young woman, your, your heroine, breaks out of, maybe. Uh, some of the old tradition, that's that's there. I mean, there are a thousand themes going on there. But there is this one scene where Leon's mom is a midwife, and she takes her daughter, who will hopefully for, uh, be following her mom's footsteps at the birth of these twins that you mentioned earlier. And in this culture, twins a no-no. I, I don't want to go into the detail too much because of the, it, it, you know, for the space of the time that we have here. But it is a brutal scene. And and I'm curious as to how you felt about writing that scene. Well, it was very hard. And, you know, it's up right towards the beginning of the oh, novel. Right. I had this feeling of, geez, you know, will anybody want to read past page 35 <laughs> after reading that? But I hope that what happens is that you can understand the culture from their perspective. So I'll, you know, the, the Aka have their own creation theory and myth, I guess you could, or legend, which is uh, the great mother, Amamata, who had two breasts in front and nine on the back. And the two in front were for her human children, the ones in back were for her animal children. And, you know, if you just take a step back and think about what would that idea, how would that play out right now today, if you believe that, that there was such a separation, and so, you know, that if you think about you know, human beings can ha- have a, a one child and animals have litters. And so if you have a human who has a litter or a, you know, a cat that has one kitten, something is really wrong. There's so it's like things are not right in nature or in the universe. And so, you know, I hope that as people read that scene that they've already gotten a, a sense enough of the Aka culture that you can sort of understand what they're doing, even though it's very brutal. And I think the other side of it is that they are animistic, the Aka, and they believe that every living thing has a soul, even a grain of rice. And so to me, what was really interesting was that you could have these two ideas at the same time. One, this idea of human rejects and what makes a litter and what makes a human. And then at the same time, which could end up in some very brutal action and at the same time this incredible respect for life and a kind of spiritual respect for life in the sense that every living thing even a grain of rice has a soul they're not accepted the twins who were born and so they have to be rejected killed let, let, right. I'll, I'll give that much to the audience but but i'm going to say something to you that's going to sound very weird there throughout the book of course there are a lot of these things that we come across uh, beliefs that are inherent to these people and some might find some of them, as you said, you know, disheart- uh, upsetting, uh, taking us into a realm of thinking that's difficult for we in the modern era to understand. And yet I say to you, as I'm reading this, that some of the beliefs, some of the sy- systems to me were extraordinarily engaging, beautiful. And, and I actually found myself saying, wow, you know, some of this I wish didn't upset me it was they gave me they mollified me they gave me hope right. uh, some of the old ways we may need to go back to right that's right well that's what i meant by saying you know on the one hand you have this idea of human rejects on the other hand every single thing has a soul and so how that would you know that if you really believe that every living thing has a soul you're going to treat nature and animals and each other quite differently because you you know you have this kind of more of a spiritual connection to that brilliant interesting the heart of the story the relationships between mothers and daughters 
And I was thinking the other day that there is no more complex relationship than the relationship between mother and daughter. You and I both just lost our moms recently. There's the good and the bad. The one person to whom a daughter is forever tied, does that umbilical cord ever get cut? Ever? I don't think it really does. It's symbolic, but it's not real. And, and then there's the other side, you know, the excruciatingly painful loss of a mother, living without a mother. Mm-hmm. I- impossible. But your mom passed away, Carolyn C. She was a great woman in her own right. Look, she created you, right? How much of her story and your story is in this book? Well, it's, uh, you know, 12 days before I the final, final edits were due, my mom was diagnosed with cancer, and she died 10 days later. Oh, God. She had been sick, but she hadn't had a diagnosis. And, and she, you know, had been in failing health. But nevertheless, this was very shocking right at the end as I was finishing the novel, which I did get to read to her in, you know, in manuscript. We didn't get to the end. But, you know, I was, of course, you know, in that moment, you're not really thinking things through or don't have perspective. And even though I said the final, final edits, you know, there's still months more of graphs and copy editing, page proofs. It was about three months later that I realized, oh, this is what this novel is about. This <laughs> is about mothers and daughters. And, and, you know, there's Leon and her mother, Leon and her baby, that baby and her adoptive mother, the adoptive mother and her mother, Deja, who I mentioned earlier, the mother of the twins, and then Site, who also is a mother. So I don't think I've ever written a book that had so many mothers and daughters. I mean, it's just, I clearly, clearly had mothers on the brain in this idea of motherhood. I didn't write about this specifically in the novel because, of course, it's the Akka culture. But in Chinese, there's a written character for mother love, and it's composed of two elements. One part means love, the other part means pain, that this is mother love. And when I was writing Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I thought, well, I get this completely. A daughter would look at her mother, a person who was binding her feet, literally inflicting unbelievable physical pain on her child in the name of love. But of course, you're, you know, you're, as you know, your mom doesn't need to be binding your feet to torture you. <laughs> yeah. uh, by the time I got to seeing in love, I completely changed my thoughts about it, that it wasn't about how a daughter looks at her mother but rather how a mother looks at her children. That that this that the moment the thing I thought about my when my oldest son was just a tiny baby and he got sick for the first time. He was, you know, like two months old and one of those terrible ear infections with a huge fever. And I remember walking around in the house with him in the middle of the night and he just oh just he was so sick. And thinking to myself, if I can just get through tonight and of course I didn't realize he was gonna learn how to drive. Right. You know, their their thing. And, you know, your kids, they grow up, they go off to college, they get jobs, they get married, they have kids. But real life is happening, too. You know, their kids don't like them, their wives leave them, you know, they lose their job. And you can't put them on your shoulder and pat, pat, pat and walk them around in the middle of the night. What you do is you take their pain and you carry it in your heart that that's a mother's love. But I think now what and with the key girl of Hummingbird Lane, I think I was, because of what was going on in my own life, uh, even though I didn't realize it as I was writing it, but this this other level of mother love, what it means to lose your mother, and that sense of loss. And I, I do feel now that I have some sort of hindsight on this, that, that there's so much loss and separation in this novel. I mean, you know, if you think about Leon and how she gets separated from her baby, but also separated for long periods from her own mother, and and the the way people are pulled apart, and and the things that you can never, sometimes you can never get back. And um, you know, we're talking specifically about mothers and daughters, but I'm pretty sure that every single person on earth, somewhere along the line, had a mother. And maybe you knew her, and maybe you didn't. And maybe you got along and maybe you didn't. But, you know, everyone had one. And that this truly is a universal experience and a universal relationship. Yeah, and, and fascinating yeah. one at that. And, and, uh, will defy explanation and definition. 
<laughs> everything for because it will for always everybody will be trying to dissect right. mother and daughter and yes. to, for the rest of the for, for eons to come. I, I, I want to ask you very quickly: Does hummingbird have a, a, a special place in Chinese culture? No, it doesn't. I I I wish it did. You know, I there was one morning I woke up and I I just woke up and I had this thought: something, something of Hummingbird Lane. And so I actually had the title for the novel long before I even started it. I knew that, but I wasn't sure whether you you gone ahead and used the word hummingbird for for that. Listen, no. Yeah, it's fascinating. A, another theme in here. First of all, buy the book just to hear about the tea and the processing of tea, guys. And and you will you will see and drink tea and taste tea in a completely different way than you ever thought possible, thanks to this wonderful book. I love that. Uh, and I'm a tea freak. Um, and I've gone through American tea farms here in, in, in South uh, Florida, and uh, not South Florida, in, in, um, in Charleston. There are tea uh, places now. It's become so internationalized, this uh, wonderful tea thing, but nothing like China, right? Yeah. I, I was recently talking with novelist uh, Sarah Koretsky. I had a, a, had a remarkable conversation with her. And I said to her that for her, the truth w- was in fiction. And her answer to me was, you get closer to the truth in fiction because the truth is an emotional state more than it is a factual one. What do you think? I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree with that. Isn't that fascinating? I think it's true, too. Absolutely. Where the feelings go. Lisa, your Chinese heritage, back to that. For you, it's been a relationship. And I wonder if, if you always got along. Or if you had any good time, you had good times, then you had bad times. If you ever wished you could break up, <laughs> if you had to make adjustments in the relationship, but divorce was never an option. Twelve books later, girlfriend, twelve books? Oh my gosh. How are you <laughs> and your Chinese heritage doing together these days? Wonderfully, wonderfully. I, I, but I will tell you the novel I'm working on now is the first one that, um, is not about China or the Chinese American experience. It takes wow. place in South Korea. South Korea, however, is the uh, m- most Confucian of all of the countries in Asia. And I certainly know a fair amount of Confucianism if you just think of that one Confucian saying, when a girl obey your father, when a wife obey your husband, when a widow obey your son. And so, you know, I was raised on that, but in Korea, of course, they take it to a whole other level. <laughs> it's, it's even stronger. <laughs> Great book, darling. Thanks so much for being here. Appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you for having me again. You're just the best. You are the best. I've been speaking with author Lisa C. Her latest is The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. For more information on Lisa C. and her wonderful work, visit her website at lisac.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to The Halle Kesser Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. The Halle Kesser Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. Visit hallekesserjane.com.